On this episode of Call the Doctor, we will talk about lung cancer and how to know when a cough can kill you. We have a panel of experts ready to inform you and answer your questions. That's our topic as we're set to go live with Call the Doctor right now. Call the Doctor. WVIA's award-winning healthcare program. Moderated by George Thomas. Call the Doctor. Hello, and welcome to Call the Doctor. Live from your public media studios, I'm Joe Krobach. Lung cancer is a complicated disease affecting over 370,000 Americans each year. It is the number one cause of cancer deaths in both men and women in the U.S. and worldwide. About 226,000 people in the U.S. were diagnosed with lung cancer last year. According to the National Cancer Institute, it is estimated that there will be 228,190 new cases and 159,480 deaths from lung cancer in the United States in 2013. Smoking cessation is the most important measure that can prevent the development of lung cancer. But how do you know when a cough can be the one that can kill you? And how do you know what steps to take after you've been diagnosed with lung cancer? There are options for your treatments. Treatments can be provided by an oncologist, and some have found benefits from refining one's lifestyle and following a more holistic approach with changes in diet and physical activity. On this episode of Call the Doctor, we're going to explore several treatment op options that are available to you. We will discuss the options and help you learn more about each one. After you watch this program, please talk to your doctor or your doctors to find out the right lung cancer treatment or treatments for you. We will also talk about the National Lung Screening Trial. If you want to be part of the show, you can do that by going online and submitting your questions by going to wvia.org and clicking on the Submit Live Show Questions link. Or call it in at 1-800-326-9842 to speak with the panel. It's easy to do. We've assembled the re these experts and they are ready to answer your questions about lung cancer treatments. Our first guest is Dr. Jacqueline Lee. She is a thoracic surgeon from the Geisinger Health System. Our next guest is Dr. Terrence Lenahan, who practice, practices pulmonary and critical care medicine for Delta Medics. Also joining us is Dr. Christopher A. Peters, the medical director for Northeast Radiation Oncology Centers, known as NROC. And he also serves as an, as an associate professor of medicine at the Commonwealth Medical College. Our next guest is Dr. Carl O'Helvey, a registered nurse with two master's degrees and a doctorate in public health and wellness. He has 60 years experience as a nurse practitioner, educator, author, and researcher. He is also a 38 year survivor of lung cancer. We will hear his story. What makes Call the Doctor so very unique is the ability for, the ability for you to interact live with experts for an hour as we go beyond the one minute news story and offer in-depth information and real help for you and your family. So we're going to open up our toll-free lines right now and give you the opportunity to ask your questions about lung cancer. Thank you all for coming today. I, I want to start with you, Dr. Uh, Terrence, and, and kind of have you set up the important fun the functions of the lungs, kind of why we have lungs. Uh, the basics of, you start from there. You, you know where to begin. Uh, Joe, the entire respiratory system is the method uh, by which you are able to bring gas into your body, oxygenated uh, uh, gas, uh, and expire out uh, carbon uh, dioxide. As such, you are in complete contact with your environment at all times. Uh, also, based on the physiology, uh, your lungs will see your entire blood volume uh, throughout uh, the, the course of inspiration and expiration as with every beat of your heart, blood moves through your body. As such, they are exquisitely sensitive to any type of uh, environmental pathogen, any type of irritant, and especially cigarette smoke, which is uh, uh, one of the most uh, worrisome factors in, uh, in the world today. It, it's sad that, that smoking does play such a, a huge role in it. I think I read 89 to 90% of people with lung cancer are smokers or former smokers in, in some level. And then we're gonna try to give them some numbers at the end here to kind of help them quit. I think that's probably the biggest problem is that the smoking uh, is, is a large uh, component in that, if there was a way to remove all of that. 
So if we're looking at the lungs, and we'll get to you a second here, Jackie, uh, if we're looking at those lungs for functionality, uh, Dr. Linehan, we're, we're, uh, we're assuming that we can't function without them because they process all that oxygen into, you know, into the, the bloodstream and help us uh, stay alive. What efforts are they making uh, to scan better for this? Uh, is, there, is there something that uh, they, they can do to proactively check these things as, as a patient comes around? Uh, throughout the last 20 years as a pulmonologist, I was faced with a difficult uh, problem, and that was how do we screen for people at risk for lung cancer? And uh, throughout uh, the majority of those 20 years, the answer was there is no screen. However, recently, due to the uh, National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, we have been able to develop the ability to adequately and successfully screen for lung cancer with low-dose CAT scans of the chest. This is a landmark event in pulmonary medicine and a landmark event in medicine in general. It is going to allow us to be proactive the potential uh, survival benefit is upwards of 20 percent in patients diagnosed with lung cancer by screening them and finding the cancer early. Early detection is the key. Uh, there is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, only two programs in the United States, one in Boston through Dana-Farber and one soon to uh, be uh, fully implemented by Delta Medics here in Scranton that involves lung cancer screening trials, including the CAT scans uh, of the chest. This is, uh, again, a leap forward in early detection. It's something we've waited an entire career for. And with the numbers being so astronomical, I think the quicker we can you know, nip this in the butt, the better it would be. I have a slide of the national incidences of, of, of lung cancer uh, that's gonna come up here. Uh, so basically, the lung cancer, and as you can see, there's been some diminish in it. And, and I'm wondering if, if any of you have kind of a reasoning for that. Uh, did it diminish a little bit because of people being more uh, treated with health care at this point? Uh, it starts back in 1980, uh, somewhere around there. So was health care changing? Were, were people, uh, the smoking effect, uh, people starting to quit smoking, part of that uh, change? CAT scanners came out in 1975. I think that made an enormous uh, a dent in and a change in treatment and uh, survivability. And so. I think for the lung cancer mortality, it's not that people are dying less or lung cancer is safer at this point. It's just that more people go to the ER, they get CAT scans for they have a car accident, they have something else, and things are found earlier so that people can get treated earlier and they have a better survival benefit. But um, I think the, the message from a picture like that is that people think that all of a sudden that it's, it's a safer cancer and that's not the same. We're just actually finding them earlier at an earlier stage as opposed to in the past, you know, it's found very, very, very late when people have found for show up with very advanced symptoms are actually completely metastatic at that point, and there's not a whole lot to offer at that point. Well, um, we'll, we'll jump from Terrence to you, Jackie. Uh, so Terrence says uh, proactively we can kind of check in advance to all this, and we can maybe uh, learn a little bit earlier proactively. Uh, so what happens now at this stage of the game if they get past that? They're not proactive in, the, in, in their attempt to, to find out that they have lung cancer. They're smoking and ignoring it, whatever you know, factors involved. To stop smoking? No, um, well, they come to you, uh, so they've, they've advanced to a, to a stage of, of, of the lung cancer where it's, it's now they have to go to the thoracic surgeon. They come to you. Yeah, so there's a lot of stages, you know, a lot of times whether their primary care doctor has found it on an x-ray and a CAT scan or emergency medicine doctor, they're in the hospital for something else, they've seen a pulmonologist that for something else and they, we diagnose just for whatever scenario that brings the patient to have a CAT scan that has something suspicious or biopsy proven, then there's a, there's a lot of key players for any potential lung cancer patient, usually a pulmonologist, a thoracic surgeon, or the medical oncologist, and a radiation oncologist. And according to what stage that the patient has, and um, it kind of determines what their treatment plan is and what in what form or fashion. And staging is very important for any cancer, whether it's colon cancer or breast cancer, but it, it ultimately determines if it's early stage or later and who can have be offered surgery or who people need chemotherapy and radiation mainly. So after that, like all the key physicians look at the scans, look at the patient's staging um, studies and then determines what kind of treatment plan they need. Okay, well we're gonna come to you, Dr. Peters. Um, 
So Terrence said proactive. We, we talked about the, uh, the tests coming back, these results being diagnosed. Where do you fit into this as an oncologist? Well, just segueing off what Dr. Uh, Lee just said, uh, it's important to realize that the lung cancer screening trial, and, and Dr. Lenahan alluded to this, uh, is important because it's starting to identify patients at an earlier stage, and that's very important. But it's important for our viewers to know that still, 80% of the patients present with advanced stage disease, stage three and stage four, which usually means the lymph nodes of the chest are involved or beyond that. It's very important, uh, as Dr. Lee was saying, that a multidisciplinary team of specialists that treat cancer, so now we're getting kind of moving away from the diagnosis, put into the treatment, evaluates the patient, and that involves the doctors that she was discussing, thoracic surgery and then medical and radiation oncology, and of course our pulmonologist to help secure the diagnosis and to help figure out the underlying lung function. Probably the first step that we take is staging the patient as oncologists. Is it a stage one, two, three, or four? And four is the mo most advanced stage and one is the earliest stage. The treatment options differ and we have national guidelines to suggest how we do this. In patients that have early stage lung cancer, if they're fit enough to get an operation, it's preferred those patients should see uh, a, a well-trained thoracic surgeon to assess for surgery. Sometimes the patient afterwards will need adjuvant treatments such as chemotherapy or radiation therapy to help extend their survival. On the contrary, in patients with more advanced stage, generally stage three and four, generally we're not offering those patients surgery up front, although there are some exceptions. A very healthy patient with a limited stage three disease, for example. And so the oncologist plays a very important role in helping the patient decide what uh, treatment is best for their particular disease and also working with the other doctors and assessing what can they tolerate. One final note, most of the talk about lung cancer is for non-small cell lung cancer, which is the most common type, but there's a very special type of lung cancer called small cell lung cancer that's generally treated primarily with chemotherapy and radiation alone. All right, well, I, I think uh, to use you guys, since you all seem to work together in this system, uh, I think we're gonna bring uh, <laughs> Dr. Helvey into this <laughs> and, and kind of, we'll start with you and uh, we're going to talk about your book in a little bit, uh, okay. but what I want to do is kind of you, the patient. Can we use you a little bit of a, as an analysis here and go from there? Okay. I have to ask the first question I'd assume most of you would. Have you ever smoked in your life? Yes. I can't say do you regret that because that's not part of the show, but at this point, you've now come past that. And right. I quit when I was diagnosed. But So now you're currently what we believe to be the world's oldest, longest, longest, oldest living. survivor. Right of lung cancer. It's actually 39 years in July. I wasn't sure of the date. I went yeah, by the book and right, I guessed that. <laughs> right. Okay, so tell me a little bit more how you found your diagnosis. Uh, well, use, I suspect, but we didn't have staging 39 years ago, so I suspect I was stage one or two because most cancer patients don't have symptoms until they're stage three or four. I had no symptoms, but I have strong faith in God and I had a dream that told me to go for an x-ray. And I pay attention because I believe that this is one way that God speaks with us. So I went to my doctor and after much quizzing about why I wanted it, I had an x-ray and he, they found a spot that had not been there previously. So they asked me to come for a biopsy. And so I went and I had the biopsy and they told me I had lung cancer and they could offer me chemo and surgery. And I said, wait a minute, I don't make snap decisions. I go home, I pray about it, I ask for guidance, and I make a rational decision. This was very unusual for anyone 39 years ago, but especially a nurse, because nurses tend to follow along and do what the doctor says. But that was how I was diagnosed, was as a result of a dream. Well, that's interesting. I mean, again, with modern advancements, and we're going to talk more about that uh, scan. Uh, but so take someone like this, uh, Dr. Lenahan, and we take his rare anomaly of, of a case uh, to, to still be with us today, and it's mm -hmm. really nice to have you here today. Thank you. Um, prior to these advancing tests, this must have been very difficult for a doctor to even to diagnose lung cancer. At, Generally, uh, it was found at an advanced stage, as Dr. Peters had alluded uh, and Dr. Uh, Lee had mentioned, uh, simply because the patient had become symptomatic in one way or another. Um, unfortunately, by the time they became symptomatic, it was often symptomatic from metastatic disease, so it had spread out of the chest 
Uh, lung cancer likes to go to the brain. Lung cancer likes to go to your bones. Lung cancer likes to go to your adrenal glands. Uh, so to use the brain as an example, you may be marching along living your life and have a seizure out of nowhere. And in a uh, cigarette smoker with a long pack year history, that would raise the, the specter of a metastatic lung cancer immediately. And so it's often, at, during that time frame, it was often being found when it was frankly too late to have a lot of options to, for treatment. Well, and, and smoking had a, a larger presence. Uh, we talk about the, the advent of the CT scanner changing that, but there's other things that have factored in there too. I mean, filtered cigarettes didn't come into existence to what, uh, early 60s, somewhere in there, they finally realized that smoking was bad and that progressed. Uh, not to blame smoking, but we have to talk about it. It's 89 to 90% of the people with lung cancer. But th those 10% we're going to talk about and how they get it as well. We're going to get into radon and maybe get a little discussion in with that. Uh, but still, smoking is the biggest thing. Preventative maintenance we talk about for di early diagnosis, but quitting the smoking is the biggest thing that people have to realize it is a very damaging thing. Quitting smoking at any time during your, time in, during your lifetime will done early enough and early enough thankfully in, includes the 40s into the 50s age range now will uh, increase your lifespan by upwards of nine to ten years the thing that people should also remember is if you quit smoking regardless of how long you've been doing it but the hope is after a very short amount of pack years if you quit smoking within a time frame of the next 11 years as a non-smoker your risk for lung cancer returns almost to that of the non, lifelong non-smoker. So quitting now makes a huge difference. Smoking cessation is as almost as important as anything we're going to discuss here today. There has also been some research that showed that if you quit smoking after you've been diagnosed, that it will increase your probability of survival, especially if you eat green leafy vegetables for some reason. There's a lot of research on fruit and vegetables and their value in both prevention and treatment of cancer, which I think is very interesting. And a lot of this, I think, has come about because of the center in Washington and the Complementary Alternative Center and also the uh, naturopathic physicians that have evolved over the last uh, years and so there's a lot of research which I review every week the research that comes out as far as uh, natural things in cancer. And there's also just to add on that uh, a str very strong foundation in uh, that in solid tumor oncology basic science mm -hmm. research because most of the interventions we use to treat for example lung cancer rely heavily on the ability of the tumor uh, we call it the microenvironment, to be a well oxygenated environment. And that's true of surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation therapy, which are really the backbone of treatment uh, that we use for lung cancer. So uh, there are a variety of reasons why, to Dr. Lenahan's point, it's really never too uh, late to stop smoking. When I meet a new cancer patient in the oncology clinic, one of the first things we review is, how can we help you stop smoking if you have an interest in doing it? And then I try to tell them why it's important, even during your treatment, uh, because treatments are usually more effective and less toxic if you have uh, if you're not smoking so I agree with the other panelists on that. And for people who are surgical candidates if they get to that they're found to be at a fairly early stage and have surgery if they stop smoking from their time of diagnosis they're not smoking at the time of their lung resection and surgery their overall hospital course and their chance of having complications in the hospital are, are lower. Yeah, I think we're going to talk about the lung transplants in there too uh, a little later in this uh, conversation to let people know that that's not necessarily an option uh, as we know there's not enough lungs for as many people who have lung cancer so that's not something that you can necessarily say hey I'll just wait and then you know when this becomes a problem but I think we still need to stick on this uh, smoking thing so those people who the naysayers always say you know why should I quit I've been smoking all my life and I'm just going to be a smoker and I'm going to you know keep the hack or whatever and again a lot of them have that smoking cough and don't know when that's the whole purpose of the show the title you know uh, not misleading in that I mean when do you really know that you've gone too far with one more pack one more pack uh, and again we're not throwing out numbers of the pack a day uh, because smoking itself is there a pack a day you can actually there's no such thing as a safe cigarette and there's no such thing as a safe amount of cigarettes however that being said the number that comes up as concerning is a 30-pack year smoking history. 
So multiply one pack of cigarettes per day times 30 years or two packs per day times 15 years, I mean mathematically. Just figure out a way to get to that 30 pack year number and your risk factors start to increase significantly in terms of worries about lung cancer. So it is a very significant number. However, and this is part of the, uh, the National Lung Cancer Screening Trial, if you are as low as a 20 pack your smoking history, 20, pack a day for 20 years, but have secondary exposures, things like uh, asbestos, uh, cadmium, beryllium, um, cobalt. Um, radon is, figures in significantly, but if you have secondary worrisome exposures, your risk for cancer even at 20 pack years is concerning. But 30 is usually our, our takeoff number. So there is, a, there, there is an amount where you should be worried. Doesn't mean you're safe below it, but it is a, it's, it's an important number. We, we are gonna go over the lung screening questionnaire. Uh, probably after the break, we'll, we'll bring this up uh, because I think this is, is, is huge that, that uh, people with, uh, with lung cancer have an option to, to, to try to get this uh, screen, the screening so that they can get into that you know, pre-advanced uh, mode where we can detect this a lot earlier. Uh, again, uh, it's still, don't smoke. <laughs> yeah. I think that's the best thing Never we can smoke. <laughs> well, I think the other thing that you ha we haven't mentioned in that is secondary smoke, and there's another two That's to three percent. We're going to get into radon as well, oh, some of these uh, two to three percent with the secondary smoking, and I think public health has done a great job as far as prevention from secondary smoke by the laws that have been passed nationally on, you know, public uh, facilities, public places. I remember one time my sister loves bingo, and I went to bingo with her. And it was so thick, it was smoke in there, I said, I can't take this. Yeah. And so she called her husband and he came and picked me up. So the laws now are such that there's no smoking in the bingo halls, and so I can now go with my sister to yeah, We have uh, restaurants and, and bars around here have them. Uh, th there's been some opposition, because uh, the smokers still want to be able to go to the bar just oh, as okay. readily as everyone else. And there's always that, you know, I had a drink or two, uh, you know, I'm, I'm lapsing. No, this, there's no, no is no. Uh, mm -hmm. you, you don't smoke, uh, you do it once, and it's only gonna be problematic to you. What's, you know, Terrence, uh, so you have that one cigarette. People say, I just had one. You know, I haven't had one in three years. Does that really take you back? My thought process is this. Optimal number of cigarettes is zero, yeah. but life does go on. And as such, if somebody stumbles and they have one cigarette here, one cigarette there, are they really changing their overall risk? Not likely, uh, but very few people can have one cigarette here, one cigarette there. What I tell my patients who are ex-smokers, if they are finding themselves tempted and they stumble, one is fine, no more than one, stop, please. And that also goes for electronic cigarettes. We have absolutely no idea what is in an electronic cigarette. They are not FDA approved. Mm -hmm. And I think they are, if possible, as dangerous as regular cigarettes that may not be physically possible, but they are dangerous in my opinion. Yeah, that's a, that's a good thing to, to mention. I never even thought of that, uh, but a lot of people are turning to electric cigarettes. I, I see them at concerts and stuff now where people just pull out a cigarette because they don't have to go outside like the bingo hall incident. Uh, so I, I think people are relying on that. And you're right, with no FDA approval, there's no saying that this could be worse. I mean, it could be twice a pack of cigarettes. We don't even know that at this point, correct? There's no testing at all being done? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't exist. And the ingredients haven't been disclosed because I believe it's a proprietary product. Uh, so therefore, the ingredients haven't been disclosed to the general public or certainly the Food and Drug Administration so that physicians can assess the safety of it. So I share, I think we all share Dr. Linehan's concern on that. Yeah, no, that's a very great, uh, great point to bring up uh, that, you know, these alternative cigarettes are not necessarily an alternative at all. It's still a cigarette or giving some replacement to that. Again, having no knowledge what the ingredients uh, are for the electronic cigarettes is, is, is concerning. I will throw out one uh, other uh, thought process. Uh, you have to uh, consider marijuana in uh, part of your assessment of any of your patients, but especially a patient at risk or biopsy proven to have lung cancer. Marijuana use, uh, every marijuana cigarette is about the equivalent of toxins that are in an entire pack of tobacco cigarettes. And heavy marijuana use will bring about very early stage emphysema and often very early stage uh, lung cancer. 
and it really needs to be a consideration with a lot of patients. And, and you know, that's weird with the, the advancements in medicine. Marijuana is becoming more used uh, as a medical treatment. How do they get around that? They well, well, from in, in oncology, in patients who have advanced cancer pain or a uh, syndrome we call cachexia, where patients can't gain weight, therapeutic marijuana in certain circumstances can be used. Uh, in this state, we use it in pill form. It's not smoked. Uh, and the active ingredient in cannabis or cannabis can help with patient symptoms. And it is an important tool we have for patients that are struggling with pain or uh, weight loss and not able, able to put weight on. But I think uh, smoking marijuana and ingesting the toxins uh, is a problem for your lung function, independent of lung cancer. Although it may certainly add to the risk of lung cancer, you're, you're, the problem that Dr. Lenahan and I'm sure Dr. Lee would agree is you're kind of polluting your lungs with these toxins and that could cause significant problems. Hey, if you want to become part of the panel, you can call us at the number on the bottom of your screen or you could always go to wvia.org and click the submit questions link and become part of the panel. I think we're, uh, we're moving along nicely here, guys. Uh, I think we're really covering a lot. We are going to talk about your book. We're going to talk about the new scanner. Uh, I kind of want to set up with you two guys over here and, and kind of get your feedback on this. Um, so we, we take uh, Dr. Helvey's uh, diagnosis way early before, before all this uh, comes about. Mm -hmm. He goes home and decides to ponder on the idea. He doesn't want to do anything right away, nothing rash, and I'm okay with that. Uh, what would you guys have done if your patient said to you, I'm going to go home? <laughs> and I mean, it's, it's, it's hard. I mean, when a patient gets bad news and, or shocking news, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's always really hard to process. And, and a lot of patients want to, you know, if they're alone and they don't have their family members there, it's, it's all too much. So when it comes down to it, you know, always, ultimately, it's the patient's decisions. Physicians can give advice, but we can't change your mind. But all we can do is provide the best information that we can so that the patient makes an informed decision so that they leave with everything they need to do to make their own decision. Whether they choose not to have surgery, some, some people say, I won't have surgery, but I'll have chemo. I won't have chemo, but I'll have radiation. Whatever their decision might be, we, as long as they approve some sort of treatment and they're comfortable with that decision, but we will continue to provide the information they need so that we know that they know what this is what's proven. These are the outcomes with surgery and then chemo or surgery alone. We know that your survival is going to be good. And if you don't, we know your survival is going to be poor. So all we can do is just provide the best information as possible. Dr. Peters, yeah, you chime in on this. Well, I think it's important, and, and I agree with everything with Dr. Lee uh, just said. I think it's important to highlight to the viewers that the doctor on the panel is certainly an exception to the rule. We don't have a pathology report. We didn't know what happened back then. And the numbers that we started the show with, uh, lung cancer is a sobering illness. We have a lot of room for optimism, both with newer treatments, surgical techniques, uh, cancer treatments with radiation and chemotherapy, and with lung screening, which is going on nationally, uh, as well as several programs locally. And I think that the issue is we have room for optimism, but it's a cancer that we want to treat. And the reason we want to treat is because, as you pointed out in the beginning of the show, the majority of, you know, we have an incidence of approximately 230,000 and an annual death rate of approximately 160,000. Counteract that with, for example, low-risk prostate cancer, where many patients are diagnosed that may not ever die of that disease, perhaps maybe one in 10. There's a cancer where we can do something called active surveillance and watch it closely, follow it with blood tests and physical exam. Lung cancer is quite the opposite, and we want to, as soon as we have a diagnosis, we're eager to treat the patient because we can make a real difference if it's caught early. And there's a lot of publicity, you know, there's a lot of breast cancer awareness, but, you know, for breast, prostate, and colon cancer, but in general, those cancers have a better survival. I mean, lung cancer continues to be the number one leading killer of any cancer in the United States, but it doesn't have the same, like, public knowledge, and the only thing that we can do is inform people. I mean, people have grown up for a long time. There's fathers and grandmothers, a lot of secondhand smoke exposure, and we continue to see the numbers rise. So fortunately, with lung cancer screening programs, and, and more to come that we can find them earlier. But, but that is true. He is a, definitely the exception. He's for an anomaly. anomaly. Right. I really <laughs> uh, take exception to that because right. I am not the exception. I know many other people who, in fact, there is a disabled veteran that contacted me and wanted to use the same protocol that gonna, I used. We're going to pick up right there after the break. Yeah. 
So we're going to get back to Dr. Helvey after the break. We're going to hear more because I want to hear more of mm -hmm. your story. Not so much to call you an anomaly, but hey, join us on the panel. Call the number on your screen. For more information about lung cancer, you can contact the National Cancer Institute at www.cancer.gov or you can go to Geisinger Health System, uh, geisinger.org. You can also go to Delta Medics at deltamedics.com. If you want to learn more about the questionnaire that we're going to talk about with uh, Dr. Lenahan later, you can call for a lung screening questionnaire at uh, one eight five five delta docs We're going to talk, uh, you could also check it out at the Northeast Radiation Oncology at nrockdoctors.com. Uh, you're going to find out more about the Dr. Helvey book here in this next segment. Uh, you can beat lung cancer using alternative integrative intervention at beatlungcancer.net. And to me, the most important one, quit smoking helpline. I honestly urge everyone that's listening or viewing today to go to 1-800-QUIT-NOW and please, that or go to the online www.smokefree.gov and make a change in your life. I think that's the best way of looking at that, guys, right, is make a change in your life and quit smoking today. Uh, we're going to get to you now, Dr. Helvey. I have your book here, and mm -hmm. I breeze through it. Uh, uh, you could beat lung cancer using alternative and integrative interventions. We, we're referring to you as an anomaly, but again, it's all in the book here for anyone to read the, the story that, mm -hmm. that you do go through. I'm going to have you synopsis it a little bit for us right now, and you can explain that uh, to us. We, we got into the, the bingo hall and the going home to, to think about it. Where did you go from there? Well, I decided um, my friend who was also my physician's sister, but he didn't know we knew each other. And we were in a Search for God group together where we were trying to become better human beings and interacting better with our fellow man. And so she said she would work with me and watch her dreams and, and pray, and et cetera. And she also suggested a psychic reading. And I thought, well, I've never had one, but I don't have anything to lose. So I had a psychic reading, and everything came back that I should treat it naturally. And so my friend Ursula referred me to a physician in Vienna, Virginia, who had worked for the National Cancer Institute until he was closed down because he was having so much success using Laetrile or vitamin B17. And so he continued to do it in his private office. I took um, Laetrile, I took pancreatic enzymes, the theory of laetrile is that there is a nutritional deficiency in the body and that laetrile helps with this. The, there is cyanide in the laetrile and the traditional literature says that it will kill you or send you to the emergency. Fortunately, I didn't know that and so I had no side effects to it. The cyanide is activated by the enzymes around the cancer cells, but does not affect normal cells. So it's very specific to the cancer cells. They have also found that many cancer patients are deficient in pancreatic enzymes. And so I took pancreatic enzymes. I took therapeutic doses of vitamin A. And by therapeutic, I mean I started with 300,000 international units. Then I took 200,000 international units. And then I went to 50,000 for a year. And as you all know, 5,000 is the recommended daily allowance. I was concerned about it because it was a fat-soluble vitamin, but the doctor told me that the high-dose vitamin E, which is another fat-soluble, would handle the, the toxicity from the vitamin A. So I took that. I took a zinc, which is a carrier of the Laetrile. I took several other um, enzymes, I mean, I'm sorry, I took several other uh, vitamins, minerals, supplements. I also was put on a diet that was 75% raw fruit and vegetables with some additional cooked fruit and vegetables. No, uh, I could have nuts and grains, but no dairy, no chicken, no meat, no protein, no simple carbohydrates. Um, I went, took, did this for two years. I added mental and spiritual because I believe that there are things in these realms that are as important as the physical aspects of the 
that the doctor prescribed. And so I did prayer, I did meditation, visualization, affirmations. I tried to be a better person and be more patient and faith and have faith and help other people as much as I could. And I did this for two years and then I went back to my doctor every six months, not the uh, physician that I saw in Northern Virginia because he didn't ask me to come back, but I went back to my primary physician and to have x-rays to see the progress. And after two years, he said the spot was gone and he guessed he had made the wrong diagnosis. Now, I did not tell him I was doing anything and so he thought we were in a wait and see mode. So my friend who was professor of pediatrics when I taught at Duke, and at this point is the medical director for Blue Cross Blue Shield for the state of North Carolina, wanted to see the x-rays, the lab, all of the tests. So I took all of the tests to him and he reviewed them and he said it definitely was lung cancer. So that was the third person that uh, had uh, validated that it was lung cancer. And as far as my being an exception, Dr. Forsyth wrote a chapter in my book and he follows cohorts of usually about four or five hundred patients at a time. He has done three different natural interventions over time. He's followed them for five years. They are all stage four. He, in his current cohort of 500, he had, he used poly-MVA. He added some homeopathic uh, substances. He had 39% success for lung cancer and 46% success for all cancer patients. Dr. Uh, Contreras at the Oasis of Hope, where he has treated over 100,000 cancer patients, wrote up another chapter. He is having much higher success rate than traditional. And the rate that Dr. Forsyth used for traditional for stage four was 2%. So I think that 46 compared to 2% or 39 for lung cancer compared to 2% is quite dramatic. And I um, mentioned a disabled veteran, and, and I know many other people who have used the well, laetrile. It's, it's, it's definitely a great story, and you, uh, you, you're here living it today, so I don't think I can complain about that. Uh, I, I would like to reintroduce the panel, though, if I could at this point, though. Uh, so let me introduce our panel members to you. Our first guest is Dr. Jackie Lee, a thoracic surgeon from the Geisinger Health System. Our next guest is Dr. Lenahan, who practices pulmonary and critical care medicine for Delta Medics. Also joining us is Dr. Christopher Peters, the medical director for Northeast Radiation Oncology Cancer Centers, known as NROC, and he also serves as an associate professor of medicine at the Commonwealth Medical College. Our next guest is Dr. Carl O'Helvey, a registered nurse with two master's degrees and a doctorate in public health and wellness, and he has 60 years of experience as a nurse practitioner, educationer, author, and researcher, and he is a 38 39-year survivor of cancer. Uh, we have a couple calls on the uh, line right now, and I'd like to take a caller right now, guys, and kind of get the panel, them interjected with us here. Uh, what we'll do is we'll take a phone call, and we'll get a couple of these back-to-back -back here really quick, and then we'll get back to this. Uh, first one's anonymous, so let's talk to anonymous in German. Welcome to the program. Go ahead, do you there, anonymous? Yes, I am. Okay, go ahead with your question. You're on the program. Uh, this may be premature, but I was in the hospital uh, in October with uh, acute bronchitis and pneumonia, and now they're telling me that my white blood count has gone up significantly, and that uh, what is a normal blood count in, in a 70-year-old female? Dr. Lennon, want to jump on that, either of you? Well, again, not knowing the uh, particulars of the case, uh, one would expect to see a white blood count uh, in a 70-ish year old uh, lady, probably no higher than 12, somewhere in the uh, 8 to 12 range would be reasonable. Anything higher than 12 would uh, at least be suggestive of an infectious process, but not it doesn't need to be unique to an infectious process. I might add uh, that if you had been on steroids, 
as part of your treatment program. Steroids will cause a demargination of white blood cells from the bone marrow and cause a false increase in the white blood cell count that is not related to an ongoing infection. So that's a good reason to be communicated with your, your doctors to, to kind of field these things out. Uh, let's go to Eileen from Einan. Eileen, welcome to the program. Hello. Hi, Eileen. Go ahead with your question. Hi. I just wanted to ask the panel what they thought of... Uh, I'm 55. I've been smoking for 40 years, which is way too long. My dad died from inoperable lung cancer. And I know it's time to quit. I know that. And, and I also have a little emphysema. So we're just getting the icing on the cake here. I was wondering, I'm going to start my Jantex, and what do they think of the electronic cigarettes? Is it because it's tobacco-free, you're thinking, okay, that's okay. Some people say there's nicotine in them. Mm -hmm. It's just like an issue now. And also with your health insurance, if they want you to be tobacco-free to lower your rates, do they also consider that nicotine free? Because I have a girlfriend that like chews nicotine gum, but like what? What are the lesser two evils here, and are they both evil? That's a very good question, Eileen. Uh, guys, we talked about the electric cigarettes this morning. We didn't talk about the nicotine gum. You want to throw anything out of that? So I mean, a lot of times when you sit down and counsel a patient to stop smoking, it's obviously the most challenging thing that they've ever done. A lot of time, you know, like people like Eileen, Eileen, they've smoked for many, many years. So people try one thing, doesn't work. They try something else, it doesn't work. So Desperation. in the mix of that is things like the nicotine gum, nicotine patch, the electronic cigarette. Some people try to stop cold turkey. Some people try to quit with their friend. At the end of the day, whatever means you choose, one may not be better than the other. Yes, nicotine gum and patches have a little bit of nicotine, but they are stopping the inhalation of yeah, smoking. Right. Like so that usage. does benefit them. So at the end of the day, as a physician and a healthcare provider, we, you know, whatever means that they need to stop is always better than nothing. So no nicotine is still the answer though. Right. All right. Uh, let's go to Diane in Milford and uh, bring her into the program. Diane. Hey, thanks very much for taking my call. Oh, thank uh, you April for 18th, I lost my husband um, oh. uh, to lung cancer. My husband never smoked. Uh, he died two weeks after his 65th birthday. My husband was diagnosed November 5th of 2012, and um, he was told he had non-small cell sequitious, and um, my husband only, uh, he, he underwent radiation and um, chemotherapy. He had three major hospitalizations due to uh, complications from the radiation and the chemo, and my husband passed away five months after his um, diagnosis. But depression, I believe, played uh, a, a role in my husband's demise. But the non small cell sequitious is that extremely aggressive? We weren't, I wasn't told what stage it was. But um, I just wanted to know if the non-small cell sequitious is the very aggressive, uh, the worst kind of lung cancer you can have. Um, Diane, very sorry about your loss, and, and our thoughts and prayers are with you. Um, Chris, I saw you want to lean forward on that and, and, and answer her question. Well, I, I, I feel for her because it's very difficult to lose a family member with lung cancer. I think all of us have in some respects because it's so common. And I just wanted to address before I get to your specific question that it is important to highlight that it, approximately 10% of patients that get lung cancer are not smokers. And it's important that the scientific community tries to identify, and we're getting there with certain genetic mutations, uh, perhaps uh, certain types of ethnicity may be at higher risk. Um, and so we treat those patients very similarly. However, there are some new targeted agents that may be of use uh, that may not have been available for your husband even two years ago. Getting to your question, the non-small cell lung cancer is the most common type of lung cancer. It, it co co approximately eight in every 10 lung cancers are non-small cell lung cancers. And yes, they are aggressive, as most lung cancer is. And it, do, it is stage dependent. It sounds like he probably had a more advanced stage if he wasn't offered an upfront surgical resection. And uh, the getting to the psychosocial aspect of it, it is important that patients at advanced stages are treated with palliative care consultations as well as spiritual counseling. And that gets to what the other panelists said. And 
for instance, most oncology offices, I know ours, has social workers that help out in that regard. It's very important, just as important as the treatments. It's, it's, it's sad to hear that, but there are other environmental factors as well. Radon we mentioned earlier, all these other chemicals that are in many of the things that uh, we consume, take, use, and we don't even know it. Asbestos, mm -hmm. very, right. very, yes. very high on the list. Mm -hmm. Asbestos exposure, independent of tobacco use, is a risk factor for primary bronchogenic carcinoma. Sadly, the mixture of asbestos and tobacco use is multiplicative so that those two factors will cause an earlier onset and a higher stage onset very frequently. Um, just uh, to address what the caller was saying, uh, it sounds as though you're trying to describe a squamous cell, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, uh, which is uh, adenocarcinoma is the most common non-small cell, squamous cell is the second most common. Uh, squamous cell will very often take a slightly less aggressive course but it's, uh, it's still lung cancer, and lung cancer will kill more people than the other four next lung can uh, type of cancers will kill, all combined. So if you add in breast and colon and whatnot, lung cancer kills four times the amount of people. I know we're in a high radon cancer population area here. It still only factors into that 10%, but it is still a factor for those that have never smoked. And even the environmental factor of like going to the bingo hall, you still do get around some of that secondhand smoke whether you want to or not. I think we'll go back to the phones now. Uh, we're going to talk to Zygmunt from Pringle. Zygmunt, you with us? Yes, I am. Your question. My question is this. Everybody knows cigarettes are bad. The government, the doctors, insurance companies, even the people that smoke them, our elected officials, everybody. How come they're still being sold everywhere? Everywhere you just about go, you can buy them. Why isn't something done? If you didn't have a place to buy them, People wouldn't be buying them and smoking them and dying from them. That's my comment. Now, what's going on in this world? Can anybody give me a good answer? Well, Zygmunt, I'll try to give you the best, and if these guys want to jump in, <laughs> I'm going to say government regulations have already been in place, and it's tough to just stop the wheels of motion and say renege that, and you can't sell things. I know they're actually trying to make a lot of things smoke-free. The government is really trying. I showed the number for the Quit Help line, which is a government uh, entity. The government is doing their best. Anyone else want to answer a little bit about that? I believe they tried that with alcohol in 1919 right. <laughs> yeah, right. with uh, very, very uh, little success. Yeah. And I think the most important word that you use, Igman, was sold. And yeah. when money is involved, a lot of, lot of good sense goes out the window, too. And money changes everything. Uh, let's go back to the phone. We have uh, Bonnie from Clark's Green joining us. Bonnie, your question? Yes, my comment is with Dr. Terry Lenahan. He saved my life. He told me, Quit smoking or you will have a problem. I did not listen to him the first time. The second and third time I listened to him, and he did save my life. He's an excellent doctor, and I admire him, and he did save my life. Well, Bonnie, thank you very much for the kind words. Uh, I, I'm going to say who would like to answer. <laughs> Nothing are, I can say. Those are very beautiful kind, words. But kind. while we're on this, let's stay with you. Let's talk a little bit about the scanner. Do you, you okay. want to bring that up now? Yes. Uh, the use of the low-dose scanning CAT scan uh, that we're rolling out with Delta Medics is in an effort to find the people who are at the highest risk. Our initial grouping is patients age 55 uh, to 74 who have a 30-pack year smoking history and have quit smoking less than 15 years uh, prior uh, to their uh, initial uh, examination with us. The secondary group would be patients age 50 and older with a 20-pack year smoking history, secondhand smoke exposure, and at least one extenuating uh, factor, such as an asbestos exposure or diesel fume exposure. Uh, our hope is that by getting these people into the screening program, we can find people at the earliest stages of their lung cancer and then be able to put them in the hands of Dr. Kim uh, and, and, and Dr. Peters uh, in an effort to uh, uh, re, uh, reroute history. Uh, the natural history of a lung cancer is find it late and suffer the consequences. We want to find it early and at least slow down the progress and, if at all humanly possible, cure it. You sent us in a scan of that item. Uh, we'll bring that scan up on screen and uh, you can kind of show us how this is, uh, you know, one of the images you had 
seen. And uh, as you can see here, it is up on your screen over here. Uh, that bottom left uh, corner there, that's that uh, right, that little nodule in the front. Of, that's, that's a tumor. That, that is a right lower lobe stage 1A non-small cell lung cancer. The reason why I brought uh, that scan uh, was very simply that was good luck visited upon that particular patient. The patient had come for something else and had an abnormality on their chest x-ray, which led to the CAT scan, which led to a surgical resection of that uh, primary bronchogenic carcinoma. And at stage 1A, you can legitimately consider that a cure. They do not require adjuvant chemotherapy or radiation therapy. So finding it early was not only life-saving, but our hope is that it was curative. Well, and we are actually all a team, even Dr. Helvey with his idea of living uh, a better, cleaner life. We all know that these foods that we process nowadays have so many things in it we don't need. These preservatives uh, and other uh, factors that they're putting in our... So yeah, a healthy lifestyle in conjunction with the early detection, along with the good treatments, uh, I think that that's definitely the way to go with this. And I think most importantly, too, is just the continuation of surveillance. So the patient with stage 1A lung cancer, that's great. They had resection and... You know, they have a very good long-term survival, but though patients are still for life, they're followed by typically their thoracic surgeon and or their pulmonologist or their medical oncologist and radiation oncologist, whoever was part of their cancer care with serial CAT scans, they continue to follow them like every six months or every one year, but for life to make sure you know, that nothing shows up on the other side. They don't have a new spot later. So all that is very important. So just because you're diagnosed and treated doesn't mean that you never have to see your doctor again. That's a good question. Dr. Helvey, do you go back every now and again? These new modern medicines are around. Uh, no. No? I, and I've never had a uh, relapse in 37 years good. since. Again, you're, you're, right. you're doing it. I mean, it's all here in your book. But uh, I wanted wants to, to mention, this. when you mentioned diet, that there's something very different now than when I had lung cancer. 39 years ago. I didn't have to worry about the food supply, but now we've got growth hormones, we've got genetically modified organisms, we've got pesticides, we've got all <laughs> kinds of stuff in our food supply, and so I advocate that anyone that wants to prevent cancer or has cancer needs to either try to eat primarily organic or locally grown foods where they know the farming practices. I would like to get these, uh, these uh, slides up before the uh, end of the program for more information. Uh, you could always go to uh, Geisinger Health System at uh, geisinger.org. Uh, you could go to Delta Medics at deltamedics.com. And again, if you want to get that lung screening questionnaire that Dr. Lenahan had mentioned, uh, you could call in and get a copy of get it sent to you and fill that out, 1-855-DELTA-DOCS. Uh, Northeast Radiation Oncology can answer your questions and set up some treatment for you. Uh, that's nrockdoctors.com. Uh, Dr. Helvey's book, if you want to find out more about that and maybe get a read, it's You Can Beat Lung Cancer Using Alternative Integrative Intervention. Uh, that's beatlungcancer.net. And the biggest one of all to everyone out there, Quit Smoking Helpline, 1-800-QUIT-NOW or go to smokefree.gov. It's as simple as that to set yourself back on that path. The caller earlier had mentioned she needed that help, that push over the edge to do this. And, you know, New Year's resolutions, whatever it is, saving your own life and quitting smoking, I think is the best thing we could say about any of this. Anybody want to throw anything out here before the show ends? Just one last thing I would say is, carrying on the last comments, establishing a good rapport with your physician, probably your primary care doctor, is probably the most important thing you can do. And it's never too late to stop smoking, and I think we've said it. I think stop smoking is the way to leave it right now, guys. I would like to thank our panel members for joining us today. Thank you, Ms. Lee, Dr. Lenahan, Dr. Peters, and Mr. Helvey. I'm Joe Krobeck. Thank you for watching, and make sure to join us next week for another informative Call the Doctor.